I was just trying to look at the impact of land use regulations on housing prices. Larry Katz has been an incredibly influential economist since uh, graduating from MIT in 1985. He's the Elizabeth Allison Professor of Economics at Harvard and the editor of the Quarterly Journal of Economics, arguably the number one or number two journal in economics, depending on who you ask. As editor, he's been part of profound shifts in economics, including watching as the credibility revolution overtook uh, the applied work within the profession and publishing some of the most important uh, scientific articles uh, in the profession. He was also chief economist at the Department of Labor during the Clinton administration in 93 and 94, and has produced important work on the role of education and skill in uh, labor markets, as well as the importance of neighborhoods in, uh, in uh, families' lives. In this interview, Dr. Katz shares his thoughts about his own career and interests as a labor economist, as well as his views about the forces that shapes the lives of workers. As always, I'm Scott Cunningham, and this is Mixtape, the podcast. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Katz, it's uh, really nice to, to meet you in, in person. Um, I've been a long time admirer uh, of your work. Ever since in uh, graduate school, we read uh, uh, your paper on with Kevin Murphy in the IT QJE on relative wage changes, and this just was a, had a big effect on me uh, cause it was really the, the first, it seemed like it was one of the first labor, true labor papers I'd ever read. And, um, it's just been, I've, I've just been a big fan ever since. And so I wanted to say, thank you for letting me interview you for this uh, podcast. Well, Scott, thank you for the kind words and, and we can go with Larry rather than Dr. Cass. Okay. I'll <laughs> go with Larry. All right. Uh, so before we kind of get into some, uh, questions, I was going to ask you about labor and the QJE and things like that. I also just felt like I, I don't really know a lot about your background. And, and I was just wondering if, if you could just tell me a little bit about where you grew up and what you sort of remember most when you think about that time as a, as a young person. Sure. Well, I, you know, largely grew up in Los Angeles in the Valley. Um, so if you want to think of the world of uh, things like Valley Girl and Fast Times at Ridgemont High, um, if you want popular culture uh, versions of where and when I grew up, that would probably be a reasonable, uh, you know, measure of what life was like for me as a teenager in some oh, yeah. sense, the cultural and other influences exactly in that area uh -huh. of LA and the Valley. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, I'm trying to picture you in Fast Times at Ridgemont High, which character you may have been in that movie. Yeah, not 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 much clear. You're probably the nerdy one working in the mall. Okay, okay. not that it would be closer to where I would show up <laughs> rather than Sean Penn or something. Yeah, Sean Penn's character. Um, well, so uh, you went to Berkeley for college. I was wondering a little bit about your high school years and how you got uh, how you ended up sort of going to to Berkeley. What drew you to it? I mean, I know it's a great school, but I was just sort of yeah. interested in that. I mean, I went to, you know, went to the public high school, you know, nearby Birmingham, which was actually a reasonably diverse place in the sense that it was sort of voluntary busing. So there was actually a large Hispanic, reasonable, you know, black group, as well as sort of uh, Jewish kids from Encino and working class kids from Van Nuys. So it was in the Valley. And while the school was highly diverse, it was highly tracked. So the classes I tended to have, you know, were much less diverse than, say, the sports teams I was on and stuff. Right, right, right. right. And, you know, I sort of ran cross country and track. I was big into uh, speech and debate, which probably got me most interested in sort of economics and, uh, you know, political science sort of issues. And, you know, I think my mother was a big influence on this. She worked in the L.A. city schools as a school psychologist, mm. worked in a lot of very diverse and lower income schools. So I got 
uh, sense of the problems of other kids and of segregation um, from her work uh -huh. and, you know, always had sort of interest in uh, segregation and equality discrimination, I think, coming from her influence. Uh -huh. And, you know, I think uh, I ended up at Berkeley, you know, largely being the UC, being free and not not having a whole lot of knowledge of other places to go and yeah. seemed like the best public university around and they accepted me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'd done some work. I'd done some classes at UCLA when I was in high school. There was a honors program that allowed you to take classes at UCLA. So in the strange world of University of California academics, all those credits transferred to Berkeley. So I arrived at 18 starting college and was declared a sophomore and had to declare my college major, you know, after one quarter. And so I think I ended up in economics because in my first quarter as a freshman, um, political science was at 8 a.m. and economics was at 10 a.m. And I decided I wasn't going to take a class at 8 a.m. So I ended up taking, you know, Ec 1. Yeah, that's right. Right. The fun, it's funny the stuff that, that puts you on a path. Uh, you, so you were always interested in inequality. I, I certainly on. was. From then I was interested in sort of inequality and race and, you know, and then I ended up, you know, when I was an undergraduate, um, you know, I was interested in macro and sort of labor, but I ended up working a bunch in housing and land use regulation and segregation. I was the first employee of the Center for Real Estate and Urban Economics at UC Berkeley from a oh. new faculty member there named Ken Rosen, who was an urban economist housing person who had come there from Princeton. And I was the research assistant and only employee at that time. I think it's a wow. pretty big, pretty big center now. And so, you know, I did work with him on land use regulations and then wrote a senior thesis about sort of how California and particularly the Bay Area was becoming much more restrictive um, in housing regulations and actually did a survey of all the jurisdictions in the Bay Area oh, and, wow. and actually tried to estimate something that I guess today we would call sort of a border, you know, RD <laughs> sort of approach. Oh, really? I got, wow. got housing data from the real estate brokers in the Bay Area and then tried to estimate like what we would call today the treatment effect of having a more regulated jurisdiction versus less regulated jurisdiction yeah. on housing prices by comparing sort of small jurisdictions on one side of a border where they restricted development on the other side of the border they didn't to see if that sort of capitalized into prices. So that was my beginning foray of so, sort of, I would never have called it that. I just thought I was like running regressions and doing comparisons, but I guess that's what we would call it today. What year was that? 1980. Wow. So I usually think of that as like the influence of, of Princeton and the industrial relations, you know, this, this Nobel kind of tradition but it's you're doing this kind of treatment effect analysis or quasi. Well, we, we didn't stuff. call it a treatment effect. We just, I just called it a regression. He just called it a regression. I'm these... saying effect, effectively it was doing that, but yeah, you know, it had none of the current language of right. treatment effect. It was just like, you know, I, what was a good way of controlling? Obviously one was worried that different jurisdictions would have different yeah you know, things that would lead to different prices, amenities, if you were sort of next to each other, then that sounded like a better comparison. So let's try to focus on the ones where, you know, across a border, you had different policies. I mean, that was, that was then adopted by a student of mine many years later, Sandy Black. I was just about to say that. As yeah. sort of the, for schools, I, I did this for land use regulation and uh -huh. Leah Bustan and other students sort of did this for looking at sort of amenities and suburbs versus cities for the black migration. And so, you know, I, but I, I had no clue this had anything to do with what we would cur currently call formal identification. And, you know, and I, I don't think it went anywhere until the, you know, people like, you know, David Carr, Josh, uh, you know, and Hito formalized all these things and, you know, Angrist and Lavi, a paper I published in the late nineties and the QJ was sort of, push formal RD into the economics literature, I think. Hmm. Wow. That's interesting. So 
I guess I don't really fully have a good, the correct story. I, I always feel like there was this discrete change in thinking about empiricism with Orly and, and, and Card and Kruger. And, but if, if you're not even over there and you're thinking this way, it seems like it was, it just, but it does seem kind of original the way that you're thinking about empiricism, uh, the way you're describing it all the way back in 1980, thinking about it as causal effects, even though I know you're saying well, you're I, we, we didn't use any, have any language like that. I just, I was just trying to look at the impact of land use regulations on housing prices. And this is sort of what I thought there was no formalization. It, you know, it was published in the journal of law and economics, oh. Ken Rosen in 1987. And it just looks like a kitchen sink regression, but oh, yeah. that's what it is. <laughs> you would never think of any of the language of, you know, current causal inference. So this was not deep, you know, this was just intuition. This was not deep insight into yeah, yeah. this is a causal estimator. That's, that's neat. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the, your interest in labor that I was going to ask you, you know, how, what the history, how you got so interested in labor. And I feel like you kind of said it, but was there a particular influences besides your mom yeah. and those personal experiences? Well, I, I sort of took a labor economics course as an undergraduate with an old style labor guy named Lloyd Ullman, who probably no one has ever heard of, who actually was a pretty distinguished labor historian economist at Berkeley. He'd served in the CEA and the Kennedy administration and written a classic book on the rise of industrial trade unions. It was a lot of focus on unions, but it sort of gave a basic, you know, labor economics training. And I was sort of, you know, in that period, high unemployment, stagflation, wage setting. So it was sort of doing macro labor type things. Yeah. You know, that was what I was interested in when I entered sort of graduate school. Right. That and sort of inequality and segregation. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, I mean, so that was it's from, from just the very beginning. I mean, I, when you, when you say it like that, I can see the, the labor macro kind of brought, you mentioned urban, but did it, was it, was there something about labor as a field that just, you know, really captivated your, your passion? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I was at MIT as a PhD student, everyone hot was doing macro. So uh, I was sort of in macro labor, but I found myself more, you know, more interested in the labor side than the monetary and others. So, yeah. I mean, I did, I did fields in labor and macro and uh, work with sort of Hank Farber and Catherine Abraham in labor, but, uh, you know, Olivier Blanchard in sort of macro. And when I went out on the market, you know, the world defined me as a labor economist, even though I was working in right. <laughs> labor and macro. I, I didn't yeah. have a clear sense of it at that time. I was sort of interested in issues and things. And uh -huh. sort of yeah. Yeah, you mentioned political science. You were kind of always interested in in the applied uh, policy oriented kinds of styles of empirical yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the um, I, I, before I talk about the QJE, I also just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the um, some some specific things. Uh, so that that paper changes in relative wages uh, with Kevin Murphy, it, it had a real big impact on me because I hadn't really like my background was a literature major as an undergrad and so it was sort of one of my first exposures to substantive labor like substantive economics in general and I was really interested because it suggested inequality uh was emerging because of this skill uh returns to skill and and technology and things like that but it seems like the the literature kind of shifted a little bit and began to also emphasize these institutional factors like poverty and discrimination. And I was just kind of curious, what was your sense of the, of those, like those debates over the causes of inequality, returns to education, returns to skill, sure. technology, and then these kind of other areas that sort of emphasize monopsony and imperfect competition and, and, and racial discrimination, just like these other worlds. What, what's your sense about, about those what? two I mean, my view is all of them are important and, you know, and you need to have a historical, you know, sort of perspective and a broad perspective. I mean, I, I came at this originally more from the institutions and imperfect labor markets. So when I was graduate student, the early work I did was actually more on 
uh, labor market frictions, efficiency wages, rents, access to good jobs, high wage jobs, you know, as a source of sort of inequality and who, you know, and those factors leading to more discrimination. Um, but it was as the 80s, you know, you know, evolved and we saw rising inequality, um, you know, the work I was doing, I some on my own and some with Kevin Murphy, we sort of saw that, well, you know, we had debated a lot. I had argued that a lot of industry differences were sort of monopsony power, efficiency, wages, rent differences, and Kevin was everything's a competitive. Mm. But what we both agreed on was that as inequality was rising in the 80s, it was happening in every industry. It wasn't that industry differences or firm differences were getting bigger. It was within every sector. Education differences were sort of widening the gaps between college and non-college is what we saw in the data. And we sort of tried to see how far you could go with a simple sort of competitive model of the labor market where you thought about, you know, different workers um, differentiated by education, by experience, uh, potentially by gender and race being treated by firms, you know, as differentiated inputs and their relative demand depending on technology, depending on consumer taste, um, you know, depending on international trade and their relative supply by access to education and by demographics. And what we found if you apply that to the sort of data of the sort of mid 20th century to the you know, late 80s is that you found, you know, in the mid 20th century, very rapid growth of the supply of more educated workers that sort of kept in check a growing demand for more educated workers from technological change, but that a slowdown in access to sort of higher, higher education and a falling apart of sort of high schools in the US meant that the same sort of demand shifts from technology generated widening inequality. So it's a you know, this, this sort of explanation goes back to Jan Tinbergen, who shared the first Nobel Prize in economics, which he called the race between education and technology, which Claudia Golden and I, you know, sort of stole for the title of our book later uh, on, looking at the sort of century long changes in equality. So what we found is you did, did quite well, and it was illuminating, you could understand why the timing of changes in inequality differed for younger versus older workers within this framework, you know, where in the education distribution. And so it was a rich sort of framework. And the way I've always thought about this, and this was formalized in some work that Richard Freeman and I did. And then in the handbook chapter I wrote with David Otter when he was a graduate student in the late 90s, is what I call the supply demand institutions framework. Mm. So you can think of actual wages of anybody as being a mixture of the latent, you know, unknown competitive wage if the world were as Adam Smith laid out, uh, completely competitive, and there were no frictions, no barriers. And then you can think of some deviation from it, which could be a rent in either direction. It yeah. could be an efficiency wage where a firm pays you higher than your competitive outside option, or it could be monopsony power where they're able to have a wedge and be lower. Yeah. And the actual wage is sort of, you can think of the relative rent and the wage is the product of that. Yeah. And you can then think of supply and demand factors affect the latent competitive wage and institutional factors, which are broadly defined. It could be market power. It could be you know, discriminatory practices, it could be, you know, efficiency wage considerations, minimum wages, impact that relative rent component. Yeah. And then as an empiricist, you, you will see the actual wages and actual quantities. The advantage of the competitive model is it's a really clear way of combining both the information on quantities and wages in a coherent way where you can interpret all the sort of parameters if you have reasonably exogenous changes in supply yeah. or demand. The institutions sort of developed on a piece by piece basis. Let's sort of look at the impact of unions. Let's sort of look at the impact of minimum wages, but it was hard to integrate them all together. So the literature sort of developed, I would say that three different approaches. The approach that Kevin Murphy and I took and Claudia Golden and I and some work David Otter and I have done 
was what I would say supply and demand first. We treat the actual, the actual wages as if they were the latent competitive right. wages and see how far you can go with supply and demand. Yeah. And that does very well for long run changes, but has lots of puzzles. You can't explain how much wages compressed in the 40s with that. You need a rise of unions and government wage setting and the minimum wage. You get the timing sort of wrong in the late 70s. Mm. Um, there's too much compression because of strong unions in the 70s and a high minimum wage, and then too much of an explosion in the 80s. And it's not doing that great in the 2000s to early 2010s. But, you know, if you do 150, 200 years, which we've done, it's a pretty good long run explanation, a secular increase in technology that favors more educated workers and periods where access to education grow, keeps it in check, and you get shared prosperity in periods where we don't have good access to education, you see rising inequality. Mm. But- you can then do piece by piece institutions. You can find a natural experiment on unions or on the minimum wage, sort of the work Cardin Kruger have done, or you know, Alan and I, you know, Kruger and I did to sort of try to get the minimum wage component yeah. and sort of treat that as exogenous and first. And the first approach that Kevin and I did, or Claudia and I, overstates probably the supply and demand. And the second approach sort of overstates the institutions by sort of giving the common variance, or you could go fully structural and try to incorporate them all. And, you know, I think some people are trying to do that, but often that comes at sacrificing the richness of the competitive model or the having the clean identification on the sort of, you know, individual components of the sort of rents and institutions. So there's no perfect solution. You know, a lot of young macro people sort of try to integrate these together in you know, more structural models, but they often have. And, and you know, as you work on the supply and demand models, you see there are a lot of big mistakes you can make by doing that. Mm. You know, how you aggregate things hugely affects your answers. If you like set, set up a model with some simple you know, assumption that everyone's equally substitutable in different groups and you treat like 23-year-old high school dropouts as being equally substitutable with 50-year-old PhD computer scientists as they are with 24-year-old high school dropouts, you're going to get nonsensical answers. And a lot of the structural modeling actually has that approach. We say mm -hmm. there are 10 groups or 50 groups, and we assume they all have a CES substitutability that's the same. And what Kevin and I tried to show is those choices of aggregation having groups that are highly similar together and very different is where, you know, if you want to do a hundred years ago, high school is the real margin where workers were differentiated in the labor market. Today, it's mm -hmm. becoming a BA or even greater than a BA or specialized skills. And yeah. so some of the sacrifices of more structural modeling are, you know, do great disservice to the data, which is why I tend to favor, you know, sort of a, you know, a thoughtful, supply and demand approach or directly looking at institutions. Mm -hmm. That time with Kevin Murphy, was that, was that a, was that a, a pretty memorable part of your intellectual sort of trajectory? Or yeah, no, Kevin was just amazing. He could, you know, he could think through any price theory problem and still can quicker than anyone I've ever seen. And, you know, this was just in the transition from SAS to Stata, Linus yeah. Welch had sort of developed Stata and Kevin. Kevin was just sort of a Stata whiz because he had sort of, you know, he was just a genius. And so, he, you know, in those days, it wasn't that easy to sort of put 25 CPSs together and run them on mainframe computers or on PCs. And Kevin could sort of invert matrices in his head and, <laughs> and figure out, figure out, he could figure out things, you know, that Stata didn't know it could do because he had the logic, if it can do A and can do B, I can figure out a way of combining A and B to do something you wouldn't have figured out. Oh, I've wow. never been able to do that, but yeah, no, yeah. Kevin was just amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. That's neat. What, what have been the, so, so, you know, as you sort of look back on the journey you've kind of been on as a, an economist, what have sort of been the, the most influential milestones for you? In terms of people and or work that you yeah, did. I mean, there have been just been lots of influences. When I was an undergrad, you know, my, you know, I think Laura Tyson's 
undergraduate intermediate macro class was very influential and she was sort of one of my undergraduate advisors. The work I did on urban and housing, land use regulation with Ken Rosen and Lloyd Ullman, sort of old style labor. You know, in graduate school, um, you know, my advisor, Hank Farber and Catherine Abraham was, who was a labor economist, then at the Sloan School when I was at MIT, you know, she really influenced me both from understanding labor markets, but thinking about the importance of measurement mm. and not just sticking with the standard data sets. If, you, if there wasn't a vacancy series, could you create it from help wanted and how would you assess whether that's realistic? I mean, she went on to be the commissioner of labor statistics at BLS and has been a real leader in improving the infrastructure of sort of data, something that, you know, Alan Kruger, a student and co-author of mine later sort of went on to do, I'd say, you know, those in, you know, I think some, you know, the macro people like Olivier Blanchard, Stan Fisher, and Rudy Dornbush. And in recent years, you know, in the last decades, you know, Claudia Golden has been, you know, my lodestone and my intellectual guidance and correcting me on everything and certainly has helped, you know, big, put the big sort of historical picture into thinking about things. You know, a lot of work on sort of inequality takes an ahistorical perspective. And then you, you can say, wow, technology is associated with these problems, but why 40 years ago when there was a lot of technological change, 50 years ago, didn't you see inequality changing? And then you need to bring in education or bring in institutions. Mm -hmm. If you focus too much in one time and place, you get a pretty limited, narrow view. And so I've tried to combine, you know, trying to find RCTs and natural experiments to get inputs, but then thinking about the broader, long run historical picture to have a better perspective of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny. You said uh, how you, that, 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 uh, that time at Berkeley working with uh, housing, that center, uh, and then I think about you associated so closely with moving to opportunity. Um, what was that? So I was curious what you feel like when you went into the moving to opportunity research, you know, were, what were you sort of thinking you would find and, and what has been the most surprising or unexpected things that you learned from it? Sure. Yeah. So moving to opportunity is a randomized housing mobility experiment um, that was implemented from 1994 to 1996 across five U.S. cities, Boston, Baltimore, Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, where um, people living in the highest poverty areas, poverty rates above 40% in public housing were offered in a lottery um, vouchers to have freer choice of where to move with their housing support. Same value as public housing in terms of how much housing would cost, but gave them flexibility. In one treatment, they were given a regular Section 8 now known as Housing Choice Voucher and able to move. In the other, it was restricted. They could only move to a low poverty area that had an under 10% poverty rate, and we, but we gave them help with housing mobility counselors to move there. So the first question we asked was, could you actually help low-income households move to low poverty areas? And when we designed this experiment, I was actually there at its origins. I was the chief economist of the US Department of Labor um, in 93, 94 in the Clinton administration. And this came out of an urban bill passed in late 92 following the Rodney King LA riot, oh. when for a brief moment, Congress was interested in throwing some money at urban and urban problems and segregation and discrimination problems. And so in the Clinton administration, we made sure that some of the money was used for demonstration projects with actual random assignment. And that was the origin of moving to opportunity, a working group in the administration, which HUD was the lead, um, sort of designed this in 93. Mm. And luckily, uh, several years later, when I was an academic, I was able to get involved in the evaluation with a couple of graduate students, then Jeff Kling and, and Jeff Liebman. And we bid on one of the you know, original contracts for one site and then worked with other groups oh. in sort of getting the longer run evaluation. And so when we had designed it, 
it was called Moving to Opportunity. I think HUD thought it was going to greatly improve the labor market outcomes of the adults. And that would be a channel to improve the outcomes for the children in those households. What turned out was surprising. The move seemed to have no impacts on the economic outcomes of the adult largely adult female headed households. Mm. And in the short run, didn't seem to do a lot um, for the kids. Um, it did, you know, there were some differences. Girls seem to be um, doing better psychologically and a little bit better in school. Boys, not so much. But, it, it, you know, so a lot of this was written off with the early findings. Yeah. We found huge effects on the mental health and physical health of the adults. Mm. And on girls, which I thought was quite important because reducing depression and anxiety is pretty important. But economists sort of dismissed the early results as evidence that neighborhoods sort of didn't matter. And sociologists went crazy at us saying that, well, this just isn't a good experiment. A lot of people may have moved out of their neighborhoods. You know, even though we had random assignment, they didn't want to believe it. Yeah. Uh, Then, you know, so the interim, the results look like that. But I was always saying, well, you know, there are good reasons to think that, in fact, it's hard for adults. The exact neighborhood you live in probably doesn't matter that much for your outcome. You're working in the same city labor market. There's discrimination facing you, right. whether you work in one area or not. But if your kids have a chance to get a better education, form connections, you know, you know, speak, you know, in some sense, you know, more the language that employers are looking at, maybe that will matter, but we're not yeah. going to know that when your kid's eight, we're going to need right. to see them as adults. Yeah. So we, you know, there was not enough, there was not money from Congress, but we raised money from a bunch of different foundations to track people longer on. Wow. And then eventually with Raj Chetty and um, Nathan Hendren, we were able to gain access to the IRS data to track these kids, you know, when they were young adults yeah. And we found striking findings that getting the opportunity to move to a lower poverty area meant that when you were in your 20s or early 30s, huge improvements, you know, the, you know, estimated tote treatment on treated was, you know, in the 30 to 40 percent range on earnings um, from high exposure. And it, what's striking is they, as Raj and Nathan were doing this large scale quasi experimental mover study. And strikingly, MTO looked just like the quasi-experimental estimates. The greater the number, earlier you move, the larger the effect of moving to a nicer neighborhood that looked like this exposure time sort of um, model of you know, neighborhood influences. So for kids, the amount of time you spend in a safer you know, environment really matters. For adults, your current, you know, so there are two types of neighborhood effects. There's sort of developmental or exposure that your long run outcomes depend. That really matters for kids. For certain things like health, contextual current ones really matter. You know, how safe your environment is today matters a lot for your mental health um, and even for your physical health. Do you have the opportunity to safely go out and exercise? Mm. It doesn't matter that much for your earnings if you don't do other things to give you the opportunity to form connections, invest in skills. And so other work we've done has shown that sort of training and education programs combined with those moves can do big things for the earnings of the adults. Mm. But the neighborhood environment itself doesn't have as big an effect. That's not to say space doesn't matter, but it's in a broader geographic area. So if your local labor market's depressed versus booming matters a lot for your income and your outcome, but it's more the level of the Boston metro area than it is whether you live in one block in Roxbury or in one block of Brookline. Right. Um, Right. Right. That's, that's fascinating. Was the, so that was a big surprise. So you, was it a big surprise for you to sort of think in terms of these short run, long run effects and, I mean, you know, I, I think we were much more hopeful because there was there was something called the spatial mismatch hypothesis yeah. that mm-hmm. was very that argued the exact neighborhood you mattered and access to jobs should be the key thing to labor market outcomes. Yeah. And it was based on a lot of observational evidence, but of course, they're huge, you know, selection biases. People who live in areas that don't have a lot of job access don't have better opportunities to move to other areas. Yeah. So we don't know what's 
what selection these people have. And, and, you know, and it depends a lot on transportation options. So there was a big hope that moving people to lower unemployment, higher EPOP areas would immediately improve the adult outcomes. And we didn't, you know, find that. And so, you know, there were, there were a bunch of arguments. Well, maybe that's because they were better areas, but they weren't good enough, or, you know, they were slightly declining and you can't fully rule them out. But I think the, you know, the similar results from sort of the public housing demolitions projects of Eric right. Shin yeah. and a bunch of other mobility things, whereas mobility across broader geography of labor market seems to have very big effects on, mm -hmm. you know, some adult outcomes and some of the adult moves in the, you know, so I think the, you know, the version I have is, you know, there's a broader labor market that matters a lot for adult outcomes and your skills, connections, discrimination matter a lot, but it's not your exact zip code within an area right. for adults, but for kids it has a huge influence mm -hmm. on, you know, the, you know, who their connections are, what their human capital is, that right. matters a lot for later outcomes. And so yeah. uh, it clearly targeting, you know, trying to desegregate um, neighborhoods, give access to yeah. better schooling stuff, the younger, the earlier you start, the bigger the long run payoff. But the other finding, which has been underappreciated, is that it's not the sort of story of if you don't do stuff by age two, you can't do anything to improve things. Right. You know, 14 year olds who moved who lived in a better area from 14 to 18 get as much impact as someone from four to eight. Oh. You know, we found, you know, there's not like, you know, as you know, there's a teens benefit hugely from being in safer, you know, uh, better areas or having, you know, um, a stronger school and others. And a lot of the second chance programs that we're seeing that are sort of some of the work I've been doing recently on what we call sectoral employment training programs, which sort of combine, um, you know, a whole bunch of wraparound services what you might call life skills or soft skills training with job development, as well as, you know, sort of coding camp training or training as a health technician or others, you know, seem to have huge sort of payoffs, you know, with people in their, you know, young adults from 18 to 24, but also women, you know, trying to enter the labor market in their thirties and their forties. So yeah. this notion that sometime that, you know, unless you only get there early, there's nothing you can do. I think right. there's huge evidence and the recent review by Nathan Hendren and uh, one of our students, Ben Sprungkaiser of hundreds of programs shows, yeah, in general programs for younger people have higher returns, but it's not that you have, you know, it would be better if we got there earlier, but the notion that we should write off people after you know, early childhood seems right. highly problematic. We have a right. lot of valuable interventions later on. So it's not really an early childhood intervention story the way that it's kind of popularly described. No, in fact, all the identifying variation from MTO that's in the Chetty Hendren and uh, Katz paper is actually not early childhood because the ones who were that early weren't old enough to have adult outcomes yet. It's yeah. sort of from ages, you know, six to sort of 18. Wow. Wow, it's almost if, like if you were if you were two at the time you moved, um, you weren't old enough to be twenty five to you know thirty uh, you know eighteen yeah. years later. Could, do you think that you could have had the exact same result with a busing intervention? Is it that mechanism? Well, we we have seen very similar results. This is Rucker Johnson's work. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So um, is that is that to suggest that it's like a busing mech? They're both kind of similar mechanisms as opposed yeah, well, we, to there seem to be both schooling is one big input, but there yeah. seems to be neighborhoods have impacts beyond schooling. Yeah. So so what we see is in some of the, you know, so busing has can have a huge effect, you know, the schooling quality or anything that improves schooling quality without changing your neighborhood can have big effects. We see this from charter school studies. We see this from work on going back to Cardin Kruger from improving school resources to sort of the quasi experimental school finance equalization literature by Kirbo Jackson, uh -huh. um, Rucker Johnson and Nicole uh, Persico in the QJ 2015 is a good example. Mm -hmm. But 
what you see is that you know, with the neighborhood, some of it is from improved schools. So in Los Angeles, which was one site of MTO, there was substantial improvement in school quality with the moves in neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. But in, in Boston and in Baltimore and Chicago, the school quality, you know, think of neighborhood quality going from like the fifth percentile to the 40th percentile uh-huh. in a citywide distribution. But school quality went from sort of the 15th percentile to the 20th. And mm-hmm. the reason is there was already a bit of school choice so that schools were not as actually segregated as neighborhoods at that yeah. time in many of these cities, like yeah. New York had a bunch of it. And the nature of the neighborhoods you can move in a housing voucher is you can get into a safer, better neighborhood, but it often doesn't get you into the better school because right. of neighborhood. So what we found is Part of the MTO effect seems to be schools, but there seems to be an independent neighborhoods effect. Ah. And you can see similar things from that in you know, some interventions where you sort of change neighborhood quality, but not schooling so much. But they're both, so it's not the same thing as busing. They yeah. both yeah. sort of mattered, but it's certainly an important component of it. And there's some yeah. nice work in Montreal with quasi-experimental by Lala Berte, you know, that shows, you know, in that case, maybe the schooling, 60% of the neighborhood effects, but it isn't the whole thing. There's other, you know, there are clearly things having to do with connections, things having to do just with safety and health. Right. You know, even right. things like being in a less polluted area yeah. seems yeah. to have long run impacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's, uh, that's a good point because busing is not going to really, well, I guess busing could affect the mental health of a parent but it, it's, yeah. uh, it, it's very yeah, neighborhood different. environments, you know, neighborhood having, neighborhood you know environments of just, a, you know. a big part of that is the schooling bundle, but it's not the whole thing. Mm, mm, mm. I, I want to talk about your, the, the QJE, the quarterly journal of economics is, is, you know, uh, many people would, would probably say it's the, of the top five, it's the top two or top one, you know, even of all of our journals. And, and it's just been your tenure there has just been, it seems like so impactful. It's really hard to, to even know what it, what effect it had on the profession. So I was just kind of curious, what do you, what do you think you've, what do you think has been the impact of your, of the quarterly journal of economics at your time on the, the profession and particularly the applied work? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that, you know, we have, explicitly try to do a number of things to, you know, reduce turnaround time, which I think has been very, you know, when I started at the QJE and took over for Larry Summers, I remember going into his office, this is before there were online submissions and electronics, and just seeing piles and piles of folders of papers that hadn't been decided on, you know, some three years old and stuff that I had to deal with. Right. to get rid of the backlog and just, you know, that was not helping anyway. So right. we sort of went to, you know, I, my sense was that if you, if the editors had a commitment to quick turnaround, referees would start seeing that that was the norm. If you saw that the elasticity of your coming back in quickly to actually being informed of the decision was very high, you would respond to that and social norms would sort of matter. And I think we were very quickly able to, you know, reduce turnaround time from, you know, six months to a year to, you know, medium turnaround time of one day because of desk rejects and conditional on, you know, being sent out, being more in the sort of, you know, 30 day range, which I think is much more reasonable. So I think we explicitly tried to be a bit, you know, when we were starting out, tried to be thematic. We wanted to do some work on inequality. We sort of wanted to do more work on growth, which was growing empirical work then in the early 90s. And I explicitly wanted to sort of take advantage of what I was seeing of the credibility revolution of sort of trying to publish innovative papers that use new experimental and quasi-experimental methods and tried to give that a forum um, as sort of a way of highlighting that work and pushing it. And so, you know, I think some of the, you know, papers I was really proud of were sort of like the Angrist and Kruger, you know, quarter of birth IV compulsory schooling paper in 91 um, was a good early version of sort of showing the power of sort of a quasi experiment. Right. Um, you know, in the late 90s, sort of the Angrist lobby, Maimonides Law is sort of an example. 
you know, also in 99, the Kruger Tennessee Star yeah. RCT showing the power of randomized, you know, sort of control trials. And, you know, so a whole range, you know, sort of in that we ran a special issue in 96, you know, just on trying to shift economics to thinking more about social problems and using sort of quasi experimental methods, people like Steve Levitt, um, yeah. You know, it was even a paper by George Akerlof and Janet Yellen on sort of abortion. And yeah, I remember that paper. Yeah, it's a great paper. So that, you know, so we so we sort of tried to sort of push things we thought were interesting areas, technological change and inequality growth, and tried to sort of push it. But also, I think the key was not stringing people along with endless revision processes and, mm -hmm. you know, basically thinking of the revise and resubmit as a contract, right? you know, right. that, you know, the editor did not say just convince the referees when the referees were contradictory. The yeah. editor basically says, you know, these are the four points the referees raise that you really need to address. Yeah. Uh, you can ignore the others. And, you know, these are the three things I think you should do. And effectively, if you do that, you're accepted. You know, if the results don't look as great, that's the way the world is. You know, there yeah. are papers I've published where the results are mushier than probably ideal. But, you know, uh, that's, you know, I think that's a much better you know, sort of approach than these endless, you know, contradictory revisions, which had been my experience as sort of an author. Yeah, you know, sure. Prior to that. Sure. sure. You, you th the, I know this is not an answerable question, but, but I, I, it's, it's interesting that you sort of brought that up. I, I wonder if, if you hadn't been an editor for this time uh, at the QJE, if, if the credibility revolution would have been as, as, as widespread then, since that was something you were so open-minded to and, and so in, interested in randomization and natural experiments. Well, I mean, Orly was also an editor of the AR. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was so editor of the AR. There were a couple, right. couple of places where there was yeah. a big, yeah. So hard, hard to know the, these counterfactuals. Right. My, my guess is editors probably don't have that big an effect, but, you know, I, I, maybe so. I, I certainly know that the regime change, the QJ had an effect on, you know, the citation rate. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, there, there is a reasonably good regression discontinuity. I know Raj Chetty once put together a graph and Stefano Delavinia of sort of the citation rates of articles in the QJ before and after our sort of shift in the editorial team in the early 90s. And we had been sort of forever, you know, number three or four among the major journals and jumped to number one, you know, in 91. And I think um, something like 31 out of the 30 out of the last 31 years, we've been number one on any citation measure. Wow. That's really interesting. That's got to feel, uh, I mean, it's a widespread, I mean, the social norms are very clear that you know, you're expected to get this stuff back and in, in a reasonable amount of time. And it's, it's, uh, it's been really, yeah, it, do, it does seem like it's been really impactful across the board. Yeah. And I think there's been a real push, you know, I think Esther DeFlo really pushed that at the, you know, at the AR improving the, after doing that at the AJs, I think a lot of the AJs. So I think there's been, you know, there's still a lot of delays out there, but I think there has been some, some shift. I mean, I think the big you know, the other big change, which it's, you know, I think some sometimes misinterpreted, you know, so there's a lot of argument that papers are too long in economics and, you know, they do too much stuff and people point to other, I think there's probably a bifurcation. I think it's great to have an AER insights with shorter, you know, one idea papers. And it's, you know, good to have things like that in science. But I also think a comprehensive paper, you know, a paper by, you know, uh, a Raj Chetty or Michael Kremer or a Mario Andretra, someone that sort of puts together the results from, you know, doesn't just, you know, puts together results in an area. So they're all there in one place and you can learn right. them, has the experiment, the quasi-experimental, the conceptual framework actually is better for teaching and understanding yeah. than having to go to five different papers. You know, people sort of think, well, other fields have really short papers. Well, if you actually look at it, they've actually written six results. They have six results from what would have been one, you know, 
uh, economics sorry. paper yeah. in the QJ or the AR, but it's six different science papers that all have the same introduction. You right. know, it's not, right. not clear there's a huge gain from that. I think there's right. a little bit of an illusion on what's called a paper versus what's sort of set out in a way to learn. So yes, there's a lot of long, excessive writing and boring robustness checks that people do. But actually, you know, if you look at citations, longer papers actually get cited more. The more comprehensive paper that settles the literature tends to have more influence, despite, you know, at least an empirical work than a, a flippant little result. Right. In theory, there's a more of a case that, you know, the short papers like Spence's signaling and stuff have ended up being more important. There's not a lot of case for that in empirical work that I've right, seen. Right, 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 right. Um, uh, the, you know, I, I feel like I, it's interesting, the themes that you brought up about competitive markets and, uh, and the supply and demand framework. I, I feel like I, uh, never really heard as much about monopsony, uh, but now I, I hear so much more about monopsony and anti-competitive labor markets and, and even sometimes about antitrust and, uh, with respect to labor markets. And I was just wondering, you know, is, is it, is it that these issues have changed over time or is it just, you know, my attention to this is, is just, you know, not, not been as attuned to. These, I these mean, things. things go in waves, you know, Joan Robinson wrote about monopsony, you know, in the 1930s, it was developed equivalently with monopolistic competition in product markets. And, you know, when I was, a graduate student, you know, decades ago, there still was a bit of a literature on um, monopsony. But I think the notion was, you know, I think before the more modern sort of dynamic models that monopsony, you know, existed, but it was more an issue of isolated, you know, small company towns. So we thought right. of monopsony power being important in mining towns. Right. And but that in thick urban labor markets, like for, you know, fast food restaurants, people thought monopsony power was sort of a second order issue, I think. And I think the sort of modern interpretation that there are, but that, you know, that wasn't always true. I think a lot of labor economists in the mid 20th century, people like Lloyd Reynolds and his studies of the New Haven labor market or a John Dunlop or a Sumner Slichter thought there was a lot of imperfect information out there in a lot of monopsony power, Richard Lester at Princeton. And so it didn't, it didn't, you know, it sort of was downplayed as being important. And when I was, uh, you know, working out things like efficiency wages and rents were the sort of non-competitive market or union power rather than monopsony per se, I think the Alan Manning really sort of pushed this in the early 2000s, late 90s. David Card has really gotten on there. And I think a number of macro people, I think, working out, you know, was the Diamond Mortensen Pissaridis sort of model that frictions in the labor market, you know, from search, um, from commuting costs um, could play an important role. Um, but, you know, I've always gone back and forth on this because you know the sizes of wage differentials that seem to be associated with these frictions you know sometimes seem large relative to the friction could you really you know have every you know people earn 25% less wage over their lifetime because of monopsony power because it takes you you know uh, 15 days rather than 10 days you know to find a job you know so there there is some logical issues of how large the rents appear or how, you know, you know, are people, you know, maybe this is all psychology of leaving this on, but I'm a little, I still think the, you know, we're not, I'm not as convinced that we know for sure as some recent conclusions that, you know, there's a 25% markdown on wages right. on average. Right, right, right. And so I think there is a push in that direction. And I think there are clear examples, you know, the market for nurses, there's no doubt we have great natural experiments of mergers showing increases in labor market monopsony power. Um, you know, there's definitely evidence that teens, you know, are more tied to sort of their local restaurants and may not move that much. And people don't have perfect information about the alternatives, but how big a wage premium 
that you know wage markdown that generates, I'm a little skeptical of um, you know taking the elasticity of quits with respect to wages and interpret and you know taking sort of one you know and thinking you've got the labor supply elasticity of the firm and inverting it because in fact there's all sorts of noise and quit rates that makes those elasticities hard to interpret. They're, if they're a recruiting cost, you know, there could be markdowns, but they may not be profits. You know, they may just be the real cost of recruiting and other aspects that firms face. I think there's still a lot of open issues there. Yeah. And yeah. I wouldn't, you know, um, you know, it's a very big difference that if, you know, firms have cost of hiring, recruiting, and screening workers leading to a difference between marginal products and wages. And that's something that's not going to disappear and that it's all market power and monopsony and, you know, an antitrust suit would change it. I, I think there are, there certainly is a, we should be thinking of things that firms do to prevent worker mobility, whether it's, you know, uh, no poach agreements, you know, right. non-competes when they aren't justified, and that's an important area. But yeah. whether the world is full of, you know, complete monopsony power, I, I, you know, we may have swung too much in that direction and sort of, but I, you know, I'm very open to seeing better evidence today. But I yeah. think the, the current framework is, you know, of more the empirical interpretation than, you know, is is a little overstated, but we'll see. I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have just one more thing and then we can wrap up. I, it's kind of a, I guess, a connected thing. I, the, the, I was curious a little bit about what your concerns are or what your thoughts are about um, uh, male labor force participation rates and, and where you sort of see that going and, and also just what you are optimistic about going forward with respect to uh, you know, the labor in general and the future, you know, well-being of American or the American society in particular, but any, any world. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's clearly, you know, male labor force participation clearly has declined. It's sort of concentrated, you know, among non-college workers. Um, you know, some of that is, you know, I think a lot of it has been the decline of higher labor market earnings, you know, from the decline of sort of manufacturing, you know, some sort of construction work, uh, the loss of sort of, you know, unions that played a role in providing support for sort of long-term careers and higher wages. So I think some of that is a response to poor opportunities. You know, some of that interacts with difficult to assess issues, you know, with substance abuse and, you know, the opioid epidemic, um, you know, some of it is an interaction with sort of criminal records and firm screening. We see currently in a tight labor market firms being much more willing to relax screening criteria. And when the labor market's very tight, you do see a rise in male labor force participation and people who had poor opportunities sort of coming in. But, you know, I think the, you know, the way I sort of think of it is I think the poor, you know, it's people care about their wages and sort of status. And a lot of the declining status has reduced some of the work effort. And the usual approach is say like real wages today are down a little bit relative to 30 to 40 years ago. And labor supply elasticities aren't big enough to explain the decline in participation. But if you said your wage relative to your sort of expectation of what a good life is by looking at how much the earnings increased, you know, of your sort of your parents or other people you saw in your high school class who are doing better, and you saw how much worse your wages are if you don't have access to good college jobs and stuff, I think you, even with a reasonable labor supply elasticity, this starts becoming more understanding. I think that's right. probably more important than video games are so great. Right, but right, right. I, right, I can't, right. I can't, you know, prove that. But I think that, you know, the rel decline in relative status of non-college workers and of pathways that gave you an identity and a job. And that's why I think things like sectoral employment training programs really push in giving people other opportunities and, you know, 
and trying to sort of invest in recreating high wage, high productivity jobs for non-college workers, you know, um, is such an important issue um, yeah. that we face right now. And this is not just true for men, it's true for women also. Um, yeah. The education divide has been quite profound in the U.S. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Uh, Larry, I really appreciate you giving me, I know it's uh, top of the hour and we only had an hour, yeah. but uh, I really appreciate uh, you, you sharing your thoughts uh, with me about, about uh, labor and your, your own, your own uh, background. It's been really nice to, to talk sure. to you. Okay. Great to talk, Scott. Okay. Sure.